Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 239 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabolsky, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. If you've dipped your toe into medieval history, played a medieval-themed video game, read my monk book, or listened to my podcast on eels with John Wyatt Greenlee, you'll already have a good idea of how important fish was to the medieval diet. Whether it was in the delicious early courses of a noble feast or part of the grueling 40 days of Lent, eating aquatic creatures was part of both faith and fashion in the Middle Ages. Because of this, medieval fishing was much more sophisticated than just a rod, a line, and a worm. From the fish trap rules embedded in Magna Carta to the incredible relay from the Atlantic Ocean to the marketplaces of Paris, the history of fishing in the Middle Ages gives us a glimpse into the vast knowledge medieval people had about the natural world and its tasty treasures. This week, I spoke with Dr. Richard C. Hoffman about medieval fishing. Richard is Professor Emeritus and Senior Scholar in the Department of History at York University and one of the world's foremost experts on medieval fishing. He's the author of An Environmental History of Medieval Europe and Land, Liberties, and Lordship in a Late Medieval Countryside, Agrarian Structures and Change in the Duchy of Wroclaw, as well as countless articles on medieval fishing, aquatic ecosystems, and water use. His new book is The Catch, An Environmental History of Medieval European Fisheries. Our conversation on what people were eating, how they caught it, and how fish farming evolved over time is coming up right after this. Well, thank you, Richard, for coming on the podcast to talk about medieval fish. I'm excited to get into this. I was so excited to read your book and learn more because it is really, really packed with information. But we're just going to skim the surface of the water today. (laughs) So when it comes to fish in the Middle Ages, who is eating it? Is it just one group of people who's eating fish? What I say at one point is that at some time or another, everybody in the Middle Ages, except for extremely dedicated, abstaining religious of whom there are only a few occasionally. Everybody else has eaten some fish at some point in time. That's a good place to start. (laughs) The lower you are in the status and wealth category, the less fish you'll eat and the less high quality fish you will eat. You might get a piece of a herring once in a while, despite the fact that by religious practice for the vast majority of the population, by the time we get into the 11th century, you are not allowed to eat meat a day or two a week, and for this large chunk of time in the late winter and spring Lent, which is right where we are now. But nobody's ever required to eat fish. You are required to not eat what they call fleshy foods, but you are not required to eat. Even if you're a novice in a monastery, the Cistercians who are particularly fussy about this say nobody ever has to eat everything on the table. So (laughs) if you're satisfied today with just your bread, and your gruel, that's fine. You don't have to eat the fish. The higher ranking you are, both for protein consumption reasons and for what we'll call socioeconomic display, the more fish you are apt to eat. They're more expensive than meat, and there's perhaps greater variety. You can eat a sturgeon, you can eat a pike. So one way you show off at the head table is to have a fish, have quite a big fish, preferably. Maybe one with big teeth, because now you're showing your dominating nature uh, and, and stuff of that sort. But if you are the King of France or the Duke of Buckingham or whatever, your household will also acquire a lot of cheap fish, particularly herring, because that's what you give your servants. Your servants have to meet the dietary rules, too. And you do that by buying barrels full of herring sometime in November, December partly because there's some abstinence during Advent, the several weeks before Christmas. And then you've got this stuff laid in from sometime from February till sometime in March or April when you're in Lent, and that's what you get. If you are a poor person on your own, you will probably occasionally buy a herring to serve up. Herrings are only about yay big, so that you might have to buy three for your family or something of that sort. But as I have said, If you are a poor widow who doesn't get any bacon on Thursdays, you're not going to be getting any herring on Fridays. You will do without either one. So practically everybody eats fish. Practically everybody prior to 11th or 12th century, and many people all the way through the Middle Ages, 
eat fish that come from waters close to them. They eat from natural local ecosystems. So uh, we've got we've got some neat remains from some urban latrines in Basel, for instance. There's some others. And in a poor section, you get a lot of bones from little bitty freshwater fishes. And I and a couple of my archaeozoologist friends think they have the hypothesis that as the preserved herring spread inland, they are replacing for people in the lower end of the scale, they're replacing those little bitty things like minnows and gudgeons and such with, with the herring. We've got a couple female saints from the early Middle Ages who clearly are consuming nothing, but their protein is coming only from plant sources. Mm-hmm. And the Cistercians in the beginning lived off beans, mostly, not fish. And by the end of the 12th century, so two generations in, people, because they're nice monks, they get gifts that endow what they call pittances. And a pittance is a special treat on a day like the abbot's installation, the anniversary of the, the saint and thing. And that was very commonly a little fish. But that only kind of gets legislated after the death of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. And in Bernard's day, they ate beans, and <laughs> bread and beans. And there's a big, a pro Cistercian guy tells an apocryphal tale that when they appear before St. Peter and he's checking whether they're really his disciples, the Cluniacs will have tummies full of pike and other, it's all high ranking fish. And then there will be the Cistercians only full of beans. <laughs> it's probably an easy way to tell, <laughs> but yes, we don't yes, need to get it's, into it's, that. It's Saint Peter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we touched on a whole bunch of really interesting stuff that I'm going to come back uh-huh. around to. But the sure. first thing I want to come back around to is you mentioned latrines, and this brings yes. up the question: How do you find out what people are eating? Because it's not just latrines. What are some okay. of the ways that you find okay. out what people are eating? Um, traditionally, historians find out what people are eating because they have dietary things that describe what people should be eating. When you get to the point where institutions in particular, have, oh, I know some saints' lives that talk about what so-and-so ate and what they did not eat. When you get to the point where institutions are keeping some kinds of accounts, you can get kitchen accounts that will tell you what they're spending money on. And maybe very toward the end of the Middle Ages, we actually have some kind of weekly menus from a couple of the English houses. So you can actually calculate out the weight of meat and the weight of fish and of various vegetables that people ate. But that's what we had for a long, long time. And then we, as there was improvements and development of archaeozoology and the use of sieving to get little bitsy bones, you can find from the waste areas remains of fishing. If it's a place like a, a secular lords, you'll find lots of pork bones and cattle bones and occasional sheep bones and, and that, depending where you are, where they get more sheep or pigs. And you will find some fish bone. If it's a religious place, you will find a higher proportion of fish bone. And if you are a trained fish zoological biologist, archaeological biologist, you work with comparative collections of bones sorted out by the type of bone it is for each species. And you sit down and you examine the bones you have dug up and I try to seek to identify them as far as you can, okay? And this will give you a distribution of the kinds of fishes that are being eaten. And you can see things shift from early medieval sites where people are eating a lot of what in Ontario are called pickerel, in the States are called walleye, and it's actually their cousin Xander, pike perch in Europe and eating a lot of pike, and sometimes occasionally sturgeon remains, although sturgeons don't have bones, so it's kind of tricky. By the time we get into the 13th century, a lot of those really expensive things tend to have dropped off in proportion. And in inland, you'll get more freshwater fishes. Close to the sea, you will start getting more saltwater fishes, but they're of a different trophic level. The big carnivores, tend to drop off just because there's too great a demand for them and they're arguing the fact that some of those populations are being overfished. But still at that point, you know what people were supposed to eat and you know what they threw away. But you couldn't really say you knew they ate it, particularly because in a place like Westminster Abbey at the end of the 15th century, we do know that the, the full brethren monks get to eat first. And if you really believe they're going to eat all the stuff that's supposed to go on the table, you can understand where they're about three meters wide. A huge quantity. 
Basically, if you're one of these guys, it really means you get to eat first. And when you're done eating, the vicars come in and they eat. And eventually it all gets down to, you know, chicken neck bones where the poor guy whose only income is eating that because he's the guy who scrapes the plates into the garbage. But look like these great big menus really are something that's getting eaten down as you move down the social ladder within one of these big institutions. But still at that point, you can't say who ate what. When we start to get to stable isotope analysis, particularly of carbon and of nitrogen, and you do this analysis on human skeletal material, you can ascertain where they got their protein. And if you're getting protein from animals, you will get a somewhat higher, I forget whether it's the heavier or the lighter, of the nitrogen isotopes. And if you're eating things that come from salt water, you get a different proportion of the calcium isotopes than you do in fresh water. And there are good bio biochemical reasons for this, because it's, it's, it's really in those differences are in the flesh of the animal. We are what we eat, so it's in these peoples. If you are getting, I'll say, high calcium and fairly high nitrogen, you are probably consuming 25 or more percent of your protein from marine sources. If you get the high nitrogen but low calcium, you are probably consuming significant aquatic things from freshwater because the, the calcium thing divides up. The more you're eating from an aquatic food chain, the higher your nitrogen will be because the nitrogen proportion goes up as the food goes up the trophic ladder. Generally speaking, we do not eat lions, tigers, bears, and wolves. <laughs> At the top of the trophic pyramid, we eat further down. So if you're eating a cow, you're really only one step away from eating plants, right? Mm -hmm. If you're eating a fox or something of that sort who probably eats rabbits, you'd be one, uh, but nobody, I don't think anybody much eats foxes. Fish, <laughs> aquatic, aquatic food chains are much longer than terrestrial ones because you start with biological plankton and then you get zooplankton that are still microscopic but eat them and then you get things like the herrings that eat them and by the time you get up to the level of a codfish or a tuna you're eating as if you were eating tigers and lions you're way up the system so the nitrogen thing goes way up and that's true both for freshwater and, and for saltwater the calcium thing will help you figure out which it is so the more uh, the more carnivorous things you eat the higher the rating and so now we can actually say that this abbess, who's a countess of Haino, who died in 699, Valdetrudis, ate fish, but only from fresh water. There's no sign of salt water in her bones, of the salt water stuff in her bones. Let's look at ordinary people, a poorhouse or something of that sort, or a village where you've got a cemetery and you look at those bones. Those people are eating almost no animal protein at all. And for much of Western Europe, that'll be the case deep into the 12th century. They're getting their protein from plants as well. They're getting very little carnivorous protein and, and also very, very little bits of fish. Later on, that will, that will shift some. Now, if we go back to the early period when we get bones of some prelates from Whithorn, which is in southwestern Scotland, and which is the primatial sea for the stuff in the islands and, in the, and parts of the highlands, there the bishops got buried inside the church and they can identify skeletons with particular bishops. And these, these fellas ate a lot of fish, but very high quality fish, particularly marine because they're right on the doorstep of the sea. If you did the same thing in Bohemia, the abbot or somebody like that will be eating a lot of carp and will be eating a lot of pike. But again, it's high up. It's fascinating that you can find this out <laughs> by just looking at bones. And so well, I wanted to make sure in, that we talked about it. In this case, it. remember, this, you've got to do this. You've got to take a tiny piece of the bone. Actually, they, they try to get at the collagen. And then it's, it's all destroyed in the process of doing the, the chemical analysis. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, to be able to figure this out, it's yes, incredible. Yes, and yes. it's great. I love it when medievalists work with scientists. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and I it do just too. makes everything uh, better. I say I don't pretend to be an archaeozoologist, but I am a sophisticated consumer of archaeozoology. <laughs> and I've hung out with these folk for a week or so every two years since 1987 because I want to know what will they put credence in and what do they have some doubts about because of the quality, the identifications and, and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so when I read a, a site report that's got some fish bone in it, 
I've got a fairly good idea of how much I want to believe. I also have a pretty fairly good idea of whether they have sieved or not. If you don't sieve, you miss small bones of small creatures. So you miss small fish. If you're just picking up stuff that you can see, you only get large bones from large large creatures. And for a fish, that means it has to be something you know, 14 to 20 centimeters long before you're going to have much in the way of bones if you don't sieve. Yeah. If you sieve, we've, there are sites like the Viking Entrepot in Holstein, oh, Hatabu, where there are 14,000 bones, fish bones, identified, and you ne- they never succeed in identifying them all, just from the top part on land, and almost that many from when they started excavating underwater from the sunken ships and the stuff around the docks. <laughs> And if you think if you think reading a funny looking manuscript will cause you to go cross eyed, think about sorting out all those bones. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. That is some serious, seriously dedicated work because yes, yes. Mm-hmm. I would not be mm-hmm. able to do that. <laughs> all right, back to the practicalities for a minute. Sure. How are people catching fish? Are they just going out with a rod? How are they catching them? Angling is relatively rare throughout. This is sort of a preface. Angling catches one fish at a time. All right. Well, if you've got 40 monks to feed, you probably don't want to angle. Prior to around the year 1000, virtually everybody in Europe is being supplied fish by a member of their own household. If it's a peasant or small household, somebody in the household is catching it and the people in the household are eating it. If it's a an elite household, be it a monastery, a palace, whatever, there's subordinates in the place who do the fishing. And it's the top of the place that gets to do the eating. Mm-hmm. And these people, and the ones who are uh, what I call engaged in indirect subsistence fishing, I'm catching it, but it's going to the boss of my place. They come out of the peasant group, and between them, they're the ones who are out there working in the water or on the water. And it doesn't matter if you're on a shoreline or on a river, you're working in the stuff nearby, and you acquire serious, long term traditional ecological knowledge about the creatures that live there and about how you catch them. And so you have various techniques ranging from things that could be done by one person with various dip nets and cast nets and that sort of thing to things that take a team of people to pull a net through the water to very large teams who build barrier traps in rivers to catch dense migratory fish adult eel going downstream salmon going upstream salmon or shad depending where you are and all of those people develop the expertise that the abbot or the bishop or the duke doesn't have. He knows what he wants, and he tells his people, do it. But they're the ones who know how. And one of the fun things is that in a number of the sa- of saints' lives, they say, we know some of this for St. Anselm, we know this for, it's a slightly different story for St. Thomas, but there's a number of these in which he says, oh, the king is coming to visit me, I have to have a fish. And he tells his people, go catch me, go get me a fish. And they say, sire, the fish aren't there this time of year. We can't have them. He says, go get the fish. And they go out and they come back and say, no fish. So he says, no, you're doing it wrong. You must go over (laughs) here and do it. And then bang, and they catch the biggest fish they've ever seen. The Mm -hmm. only people who don't need traditional ecological knowledge are those with supernatural powers. (laughs) Okay. And they're always one-upping these poor fishermen in this kind of context. But generally speaking, prior to the year 1000, Almost everything in Western Europe is going to be fished that way. In the course of the 11th century, we see emerging people who are fishing professionally as what I call artisanal fishermen. They're using much the same techniques. Many of them may be personally or institutionally descended from the people who are fishing for a big shot, but can catch surplus and he gives them permission and they can go sell these in the town. The towns at this point are very small and there's not many of them, but there are people there who are not engaged in food production themselves and they will buy the fish. Technologies don't change much and the place where you're getting your fish relative to the consumer doesn't change much. But the process of getting it from the living animal to somebody's plate is goes through a market instead. And that will remain probably the predominant, will become ever more predominant as the Middle Ages go on. Only in the course of, at the earliest, the late 12th century, and that would be only for herring, but 13th, 14th century, do people start going long distances away to catch a fish that's now going to be moved through trade channels 
in order to be sold then on the market in bulk. And that will be primarily, but not totally marine. And most of those things, some of them coming from as much as 1,500 kilometers away, are preserved. They're either preserved in the case of herring, in the case of tuna, they are preserved in brine. The herrings are semi-gutted and packed in brine in barrels. The tuna are caught, cooked in brine, and then packed in, in barrels, great gobby chunks uh, <laughs> of, of tuna, and particularly on the Spanish coast, but also in Sicily. And those things can then be moved for months. And in the course of the later Middle Ages, there's improvements in the technologies, not so much in the capture technologies. It's pretty simple. You put out gill nets primarily overnight for the herring. The herring, which tend to be feeding on plankton that are staying lower down in the water in bright daylight, when it gets dark, the plankton come up and the herring come along and get caught in the gill nets and they get pulled in, dragged to shore, salted down. After sometime the 13th century, most of them are semi-gutted before being salted. The cod are caught with the same kind of hand lines that are traditional places like Newfoundland, and then later on with long lines. But there you're fishing with a hook, but you're not angling as such. But inland, angling techniques are employed to some degree also for localized commercial kind of fishing. And that's where we get some of our first texts about how to catch fish. We have no text about how to catch fish out in the ocean or even in big water. No text about how to, how to put down a seine net or anything like that. We have first in little tiny bits and then in longer tracts and treatises from the late 14th and into the 15th and 16th century, things about how to catch fish, how to make baits, how to make and use these traps that look like a big bottle made out of wicker with points the fish could get in and then can't get out. And you use a different kind of bait there. You're trying to attract the fish. You're not trying to get it to bite. If you're going to put something on a hook, you want something that, that the fish will bite. All those techniques exist in the Middle Ages, and they are used selectively. We have the inventory from Tegern City Abbey, which is on a subalpine lake 25 kilometers south of Munich. And in the 11th century, the cellarer, which means the economic manager for the abbey, draws up an inventory of the equipment that's in the cellarer's office. And he's got six or seven different kinds of nets and also different kinds of traps. The names for most of them have to do with this one's for whitefish, this one's for trout, this one's for... And then you can tell, in some instances, rather tells whether this is a, a seine net that's pulled through the water or something that's put down to the bottom and then pulled back up. And then he's got also the, those basket traps that I talk call pot gear because it, it's the same as the like, Same principle as things like a lobster pot, only it's shaped differently, but it's the same, same principle. You get something to come in and you can't get out, and then you pull it out, open the back door, as it were, I'll pull the thing up. So those people know how to do it. And much of our angling history, in particular, very clearly derives directly from that, from developing something, you can get something to bite. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it sounds basic. But it really needs that's, to work if you're going to feed an entire monastery. <laughs> that's true. That's true. And remember, this is a world without refrigeration, mm -hmm. which is why if you get a great big catch today, you're either going to have to eat that up or keep it somehow. Short-term keeping, you can do kind of a quick pickle sort of thing that'll last for a while. You can smoke it, and depending on the smoking technique, it'll last for a couple weeks or maybe a month or two. You can put it in aspic, and it'll be kept for a while. Or if you've got a bunch of fish and have a little place where they can be enclosed in water because you have a small pond or a, a circular bag net, you can put them in there. And now you have what we call a stew pond, which is a way to keep fish alive until you want them. Now, if you're catching marine fish, you can't stick them in the fresh water because they will die. Most of them will die fairly quickly. If you're catching something like salmon, which if the, when they're big are transitioning from living in a marine environment to living in a freshwater environment, which requires that they reverse their kidney function, you can catch salmon and put him in a pond next to the monastery or to the ducal palace, and he'll be good probably, he or she will be good for uh, several months or for the rest of that season. But that's it. And it has the effect in terms of studying this stuff that you see all these descriptions of ponds. And some of them are called piscina, which literally means fish pond. But there's two neat, very early medieval texts 
Isidore Seville, and some later English ones, in which he says, it's called Piscina, but that isn't exactly what they all are. Some of them, contrary to the meaning of the word, are used for other things. And if you've just got a little one, they're not rearing fish, they're, at, at, they're rather doing the laundry and a bunch of other things, but they might be keeping fish from local waters still alive until they can be consumed. The Duchess of Burgundy has a place, oh, it's, it's about 15 miles from Dijon, what's the name of it now, where she commonly lives, though the Duke is romping about. And they're moving wild carp by the tens of thousands from the Seine River, where they've got some ponds that are formed by dams. And when they harvest those, those go into the pond. And that court is eating 20, 30 of these fish a day on a normal day, because they're well inland. And so if you want to have fresh fish, this is who have fresh fish. If you want to have marine fish there, you're going to have preserved fish. And every doctor in the Middle Ages knows the preserved fish aren't as good for you as mm -hmm. fresh fish. Mm -hmm. Well, this is one of the things that I learned from your book is that I always thought that having fish in the fish pond was kind of just a temporary way to keep them alive before you ate them. Yes. Some They've been and caught somewhere true. else. But yeah. in the book, you also mentioned that they are farming them. And this is they're something farming, I hadn't realized. Yes, yes. Can you tell and us about that? Okay, <laughs> the techniques for this is kind of strange. And very few people have worked with the primary sources and know something about fish in order to be able to do this. People like, oh, fish pond. If fish ponds, they must be rearing fish. Oh, they must be rearing carp. Carp at the beginning of the Middle Ages in Europe only exist in Black Sea drainage rivers, and they only have come up the Danube as far as Vienna. They will, in the course of the next 500 years, 400 years, move, get from Vienna to the Rhine and by the 12th century, and they will be to the western portions of France by the end of the 13th or 14th century. They don't make it to England till the late 14th or probably even 15th century. And all of that movement is sort of accidental. Fish getting put into a store pond and getting out. And if carp get out, boom, if the waters are good, they'll reproduce like the Dickens. <laughs> In Northern France, from the 11th century, we have both physical evidence in the form of dams, uh, datable construction, and of references to ponds, which were not being done earlier, that are being done for, I should say, growing fish, not necessarily really rearing yet. And this, these technologies are being worked out with Abramus Brahma, common bream, which is a, it's related to carp, although in a different genus. And whereas carp will, in those temperate climates, get to be about two kilos in three to four years, bream will take another year or two, carp are faster growing. There are no carp. But these are a nice handy size. I guess you could say that a, a harvested bream at a kilo or so could easily feed three monks or something of that sort. And they seem to reproduce quite comfortably. They like warm water. They can handle cooler temperatures for successful spawning than carp. So the techniques of filling a pond with water, putting in these fish, which you've caught the little ones in a river, and having them grow until they're ready to be harvested, and then harvesting by draining the pond and pulling all the fish out, which means that if you want to have them with regularity, you've got to have multiple ponds. These are worked out in France, in northern France, north of the Loire, let's say, Paris area and all that. They are pretty well worked out probably by 1150. No carp for another century. And when the carp, and the king of France has ponds, the Duke of Normandy have ponds, monasteries have ponds. One of the times we know the best about it is a pond somewhere in Maine, I think. The system is has both secular lords with ponds and monasteries with ponds, and they've got to sort out whose pond, how you do it. And when one of them drains the water, what happens to the water to the other guy's pond? And this is how we find out they're doing this, because mm -hmm. we have agreements or yeah. arguments that present, result in agreements. When we get to the 1250s, the carp have been as, as close as the Rhine by the middle of the 12th century. 1250s, bang, they're in Paris. They're on the market in Paris and the Count of Champagne. And the royal ponds 
people are putting carp in those ponds. We know it because they say so. They're carpus or carpo, depending on quite how you're writing it. And what's interesting is at this point, this fish is understood specifically. It's not just what a former student of mine who helped doing one of my databases and I called fish fish, which is it's a fish, but you can't tell what kind. These are carps, and they've also got bream. By the end of the 13th century, very few French pond enterprises are rearing bream. They're just in the north of France, or they're just rearing carp. And this is now an organized way of operating a rural estate. You've got these these systems on a little river all dammed up. You've got bypass sluices around each of the ponds. So when you drain it out, the water will not just go into the next pond down because they've learned that if you use water that's been full of fish and move into the pond below, it'll inhibit the growth of the fish down below. So they guide that around. So the bypass channels and by the early 14th century, one of the management processes is now you, you've got the pond that's been drained dry to take the fish out. Now you plow it. And you've done this in the fall, more than likely. And now you plow it and you sow it with barley or something in the course of the winter, late winter and spring. And you leave that grain there. You might put sheep in to eat and dump on the bottom of the pond. And now when you're ready to restore the water, you put it back in and you've converted the nutrients that are in an anaerobic state in the bottom of the pond into something that's accessible because it's now in the vegetation or in the in the manure from the animals. And this now raises the nutrient level from the ponds. Water plants grow and the fish that you put in there happily eat the plants and particularly the little creatures that live on the plants. So carp actually count as a third level, 3.5, something like that, in the acrophic scale, because they get as much of their nourishment from the animals that are on the plants that they eat as they get from the plants themselves. And that whole business is in operation and out of elite properties in France before 1300. And we can actually trace it on an annual basis before the Black Death in a 10-year run of estate management stuff that belongs to the Queen Mother of France that runs from the, she's got properties up in Brie, north of Paris. And the management is done by a team with a guy who's the expert and a guy who's a scribe. And there's a couple dozen ponds. Some are being used to grow little fish. Some are getting the fish that are now going to grow for three years before they get harvested. So they're being put in they're at a size that the French call Norien, the Germans call them Setzlinge, which means they're about six inches long, six to eight. And they'll get harvested when they're a couple kilos. And they, they count the number of fish they put in. They count the number of fish they take out. They count the number of fish that are so given to, to, to dealers who are going to go sell them in Paris. And they count the number of fish that are being retained to send to the Queen Mother's place. And sometimes they count the number of fish that are taken out of that pot that's used to stock another pot. And they're doing all that before the Black Death. We have similar documentation for the Duke of Burgundy about 200 kilometers further southeast. There are people who thought that this whole system only really appears after the Black Death, and that's not true for France. And the French technique, because all the high-level elites in Northern Europe, at least, are all related to each other, that technique spreads eastwards whence the carp came. So that in the middle of the 14th century, the king of Bohemia, who has lots of French family connections, is promoting this in what's now Czechia. And then... For these later periods, we have account books from Czechia, we have account books from southern Poland and from Austria, uh, 15th, early 16th century, all the same techniques. And we have there manuals on how to do it. I've turned up a couple of them in manuscript that date to the 1520s, early 30s. The auxiliary bishop of Omuts, a guy named Jan Dubravius, at the request of the big merchant, Jakob Fugger, wrote a whole book on how to run a pond farm based on Czech practice. And that gets, he writes it in the mid 1530s, it gets printed in 1547. And that tells you how to do it. And what's neat, none of the people who work on the, that Czech or German stuff have very paid attention to French stuff and, <laughs> vice, and, and vice versa. And when you do it, when you've read both, you realize that these handbooks are telling you how to do what the French were doing in 1300. So that's where the technique is all there. Why we do not have any written how to do it manual from a French speaking world, I have no idea. I mean, I have some ideas, but I have no, no sign. I mean, 
Why is nobody interested in writing this down? Did it get destroyed in the revolution because so many of that sort of manuscript material may well have been destroyed in the revolution? Mm -hmm. But you can see the emergence of the technology in the kind of procedural sources in France in the 12th, 13th centuries. And then you can see it spreading in the 14th, 15th century, and then you get the how-to it things done further east. That seems to be the case with so many practical manuals. If you're illiterate, you don't necessarily have your hand in the right. Now there's a, there's a few of those that are exceptions. There's a wonderful how to be a shepherd thing. Yeah, yeah. By, uh, if you may maybe have talked about that with sports. Not yet. <laughs> oh, it's in French in the 1370s. This fella has been a shepherd for one of the French bishops, and for some reason or another, he's favored by this bishop at all, and he is illiterate, but he comes along to the court and the king of France in 1370s. He's there kind of recovering from some defeats in the Hundred Years' War and stuff. And so it's an erudite court and they're interested in this. They, they, there's other, other writings. And someone helps this man write down how to be a shepherd. And there's a neat English translation available, really fun with advanced students. One of the things that intrigues me is this whole process of knowledge conveyance of these people who are functionally illiterate. And then the point at which that traditional ecological knowledge gets moved into text. And my, my second book called Fisher's Craft and Lettered Art was about those earliest texts, which are late 15th, early 16th century. And they all turn out to be how to catch fish. But there's, <laughs> other, other, there's, uh, there's the agricultural manuals that are somewhat early, late, late 14th, 15th century Spain, other places that you get those. But again, it's the transference of knowledge from the illiterate people who learn by doing and who know how to do it to people who don't know how to do it, but for some reason want to, even if what they want is really to be able to check on whether their people are doing it right. <laughs> uh, or say, it's probably like going up to your architect saying, I know what you're trying to do here, but I decided I really want to have a dormer up there. <laughs> and the guy says, all right, all right. <laughs> it's like so the I beginning. sympathize with these fishing experts who the saint is telling you, go fish there. And the saint, he knows perfectly well there's no fish there. Yeah. It's like the beginning of, of Googling your medical ailment. Well, you have a whole bunch of books that people can go and look at. You have books on fishing for fun in the Middle Ages, so we'll have to send people there. But thank you so much for talking to me about the catch today. It's been a pleasure. You're very welcome. Thank you very much for having me. To find out more about Richard's work, you can visit his ResearchGate page or visit his York University faculty page. His new book is The Catch, an environmental history of medieval European fisheries. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on, Peter? Hey, hey. So this week we put out the 10 open access articles that were published in March. It's a little late, but I think we have a pretty good list up there. And there was one that really caught my eye because it's about the Bayou Tapestry. Nice. Yes, yes. So that's always something like who made it, why, you know, all, all those questions are much debated. And there's this new piece by Mark Hager, who argues that it may have been done by a figure that we all kind of known as Turol the Dwarf. Okay. If you look in the manuscript, there's this very small individual okay. that, that kind of shows up. And the suggestion is that he and a couple of other knights may have been the ones responsible for creating the Bayou Tapestry. Oh, so they commissioned it, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh. So that is probably for all you Bayou Tapestry fans, probably something worth reading. Nice. And so we have 10 on the website, plus we found another 40 from March that we've put on our Patreon. Right. So people at all levels of Patreon can access this? Not all levels, but if you're up, I think about $5, you can get it there. So something I would love to do, finding all these articles from all sorts of journals. I don't even search through Academia EDU. So these are all really fresh published in the month of March. That is awesome. And I think that it's worth saying that $5 a month is a steal to get these curated by somebody who's a trained librarian, which is you. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I, I miss my librarian days. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're still digging for information on the daily. I love it. What else yeah. have you got for us, Peter? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Steve Mulberger is back. He wrote a piece for us about fierceness between William Marshall and Richard I. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, they met up at a siege. 
And there was a little trouble between the two. So we will have to read Steve's article to find out. Yes. Spicy relationships. Spicy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it. So we have that and a few other articles as well. The Battle of Duplin Moor. If you want to look at battles where Scott's really lost badly, that's one for you. So. <laughs> Okay. Well, I mean, I think there's a few examples in history, unfortunately. It's not but the only one, one but yes. <laughs> yeah. There's a new one people can check out. Awesome. Thanks so much, Peter, for telling us what is on the website this week. Thanks. As always, it's time to take a moment to thank all of you who support my work and the work of other indies through Medievalist.net's Patreon page. Whether you're a member of our book club, happily downloading articles and ebooks, or just hanging out for moral support, your patronage is very much appreciated. It's your support that makes this podcast possible, so thank you. To become a member of this awesome club and support your favorite medievalists, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from fishes to dishes, follow medievalist.net on Facebook or X at medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, across social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of Chivalry and Courtesy, Medieval Manners for a Modern World, now out in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself a wonderful day. Yeah.